Hello everyone and welcome to episode 2 of Always an Expat, a podcast dedicated to elevating expat stories, brought to you by fellow expat, yours truly, Richard Taylor and Plan First Wealth. My guest today is Matt Dixon. Matt is a realtor with Compass in Windermere, Florida, and he covers the Orlando area, serving domestic and international clients. But of far more importance is the fact that Matt is a fellow Boltonian. (laughs) FYI, that's someone from Bolton. So I'm excited to talk to Matt today because he's from Bolton. So we're going to spend an hour talking about flat cap beer, which is just the best, and I miss it so much. <laughs> we're going to compare notes on who was the most poorly behaved in which local pubs, which we've already spent a considerable amount of time doing. So if you're from Bolton or one of the surrounding towns, buckle up, you're in for a treat. But if you're from further afield, I don't know, like, heaven forbid, Birmingham or something, well, I apologize in advance. <laughs> so without further ado, let's get straight into it. Hi, Matt. Welcome to Always an Expat. Thanks very much, Richard. What a fantastic introduction! <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, we'll try yeah, to we'll try to keep the the need for interpretation down, right, to its minimum. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how I'm not, I'm not sure how that'll go, uh, but we'll do our best. Cool. Right. Well, look, it's a story about uh, the expat journey. So tell me how you ended up in the unfortunate position of uh, <laughs> of, of being here, chatting to me, <laughs> being in the colonies. Um, yeah. uh, so I. I I started coming to Orlando on vacation. It's a fairly typical story, really, um, certainly in this area. Started coming on vacation to, or holidays, we used to call it back then, when I could speak properly, with my then wife and my two young children, actually one young child at the time, back in the early 90s, actually late 80s. Came over to uh, to see Disney. I didn't really want to come in the first place. That was one of those holidays where it's like, let's go to Florida. And I'm like, I didn't, I, I wasn't, mm. I didn't want to come. And Why? I had this experience. Yeah, it was strange. I didn't want to go. I wanted. To, I was a francophile. I really wanted to go to France. I've been brought up traveling to France with my parents and my sister. And I'd, I'd discovered Europe as a young man. I'd toured around Europe quite a bit. And um, I didn't want to come here at all. And I got here and we, we came to this big house, this big five-bedroomed house, which I came from a, a three, three-bedroomed, you know, semi-detached house in Bolton. And... Um, <laughs> I ended up going to this mansion uh, at a place called Bonaventura Lakes, which is to the east of Disney. And um, I thought, wow, this is amazing. Swim pool, the whole deal. Anyway, first the first trip to the theme park was the day after we arrived. And I remember getting onto, and I really remember this, like viscerally remember it. We got onto Main Street USA inside Disney World and I looked up towards the castle and there's something happened. <laughs> it was just like the weirdest experience. I just fell in love with the idea of America. I'd always been into the music and the culture. Um, I was very much into the music of America. But seeing Disney for the first time kind of did something. And I don't think it was actually Disney. It was the fact that there was this American idea that if you can perceive it, you can achieve it, right? And that really appealed to where my mindset was at at that particular point in my life. And I guess what I'd been leading up to to that point. So it led from there. I ended up, after a couple of years, buying a, a holiday home. And then the company that I bought the home for recruited me to to create a sales network um, in the UK initially and then throughout Europe and then start selling properties. And then it became almost inevitable that at some point I'd move across here. So and, and it was, possibly, it was, yeah. Was, was it, it literally a light bulb moment? That's not that's not that's not become the myth afterwards. It was literally no, it you was looked literally, up and thought. It was, it's one of those moments in your life where you go, you're very affected by it. And, yeah. and as I say, it took me a while to assimilate what that feeling actually was about. I, re- I remember like getting into the day. I could, I, I'm not, my memory's really bad actually, generally. But I remember mm. almost every movement of that day. I remember which direction we took around the theme park. I remember which rides we went on to. I remember that it was my first experience of a theme park at 92 degrees. And, and the lines for the, because there was no like fast passes back then. And the lines for the rides were kind of like an hour and a half or two hours. And we stood in the sunshine, you know. And that's, I remember every moment of it, so it was literally a light bulb moment. But even at that point, I didn't connect that I could do anything other than, than just come on holiday, right? Mm, it mm. was only after that that the, that the idea started uh, uh, appearing to me over the next couple of years. So, you know what? We could actually make a fist of this and actually go out there and change our lives. And that's what we did. But then how? Because it's, it's, it's one thing to think that. It's a totally totally different thing to actually be here 20 years later yeah it really is Having made that move yeah and somebody once said to me you know because obviously things have happened over the years and you meet people who've had like uh, the expat networks that that i speak to and yourself included that 
everybody's got their own unique story, but there are some commonalities. And one of them is is that you wanted to to change, right? You you're ready for a change. You're ready to kind of go and explore something different. And most people don't do it. Most people don't make that decision. And that and that's that's there's no. I mean, that is what it is. Um, but for me, it was a case of, it wasn't anything bad. I loved my hometown. I loved the culture that I came from. I loved uh, the fact wait, that I was li living in wait, most- you came, well, But you came from Bolton. Yeah, it's a, mate, you know as well as I do <laughs> that there's Bolton and then there's Bolton. I'm joking, everyone. I know, I know. I'm joking, I, I love but, it. I'm proud, I'm a proud Boltonian. It's funny, record. isn't it? Because when people talk about Bolton that don't know Bolton, they think it's like this grubby little working class town in the middle of nowhere, right? It's well, just like a satellite of Manchester, but- it's a lovely place. I love it. Right? No, but but it, it but it is though, and, and <laughs> it's not. No, no, no. It, like the the vision they have, the mill town, you know, dark yeah. satanic mills. Yeah, it is that. And like, if we talk about Bolton Town Centre now, it is grim. Yeah, it is grim. But yeah. it's also a great place full it's of very, great very, people. Very honest is what I've found, and I've appreciated that over the years because I know we're going to move on to other topics in in this conversation. But one of the things that I really miss is how straightforward it is if you yes. said something yeah you pretty much got the truth you know from people yeah and that's something that i had to learn over, over years coming over here because i'm fairly gullible in a lot of ways and um yeah. it's easy to get time for a ride uh, especially in a place where nobody's from orlando's nobody's from orlando right it's a it's a town of of, of 1.5 million people that's some city centers about 200,000 people which is roughly the same size of bolton right a little bit smaller mm. but most people in that 1.5 million are not from here they're, they're actually from other parts of the world and they come with their own stories and their own leverages and their own needs to, to exist. But I do miss that, that, that spades a spade kind of honesty from where we're from. Uh, 100%. So I, I lived in uh, Dubai for a few years mm. and in Dubai, we just got co you know, we got adopted by a, a group of Londoners uh, mm. who were Irish, Irish, Irish Londoners. Mm -hmm. um, and they, were, they just basically adopted with the token Northerners. Yeah. And before that, I hadn't really known any Southerners, let alone people from, from London proper. Yeah. Great people, love them to bits. Yeah. But I always used to say, like, we, like it, things are so much more straightforward and simple up north. I, it, where I'm from, if we have a dispute, we can settle it with a cup of tea or a yeah. beer. Yeah, that's right. And if yeah. it's a beer, usually several beers. Like yeah. it's just everything is everything sold or a cup of tea yeah. or a beer. Yeah. It was just it, the, 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 the Southerners, the Londoners that I knew, they approached things uh, Different. Totally different. But that's not to say that the North isn't sophisticated because it is. I mean, there's a lot of, of innovation in the North. And I know in recent years, the politicians have been calling that area of the country the Northern powerhouse, which I think is somewhat patronising because there's much more to it than just an industrial history. It's very innovative, the music scene and, and the technology parks. And, you know, Manchester's now Britain's second city. It's, and it's a phenomenal growth rate. So there's, I think um, it was the, the British comedian Paddy McGuinness, yeah. right? Peter Case, uh, sidekick, who once yeah, said, yeah. "How can you tell a boy from Bolton in London? He's the one that's walking around going, how much?" Um, <laughs> and there's a the <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a truth to that as well. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Uh, in Manchester's booming. I, I lived in yeah. Manchester before I left, and uh, I worked in the city centre, and it's mm. changed dramatically since I was Amazing. there. It is booming. I yeah. took my current wife there um, a few couple of years ago, a few years ago. Um, but we went back recently. I've got a very good friend who's, he was a client and he's become a very, very good friend of ours who lives in South Manchester. And we love staying in the city centre of Manchester. It's such a walkable, friendly, open city with so mm. much vibrancy. You know, there's a lot going on there. It's really cool. Yeah. And Mancunians are great. Northerners yeah. are great. I, yeah. I, I joke about Bolton, but just, just for everyone listening, if anyone cares, I do love it. <laughs> right. So how did you actually make it happen then? How, so, how did you get yourself here? Yeah. So what I did, um, I came across some what they call an L1 visa. Um, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, an L2 visa, which is a managerial position with inside a company. And at that particular time, you had to show... Um, so what happened was I had an engineering business that I, I went into with my father. My father retired and I carried the business on. And I was doing this. I was a terrible engineer. My father was a bespoke engineer, really knew what he was doing, time served, went to, you know, worked at British... Um, at uh, Hawker Sidley, as it was, in Horwich. Um, <laughs> and he... Um, he retired and left me in charge of, of the business and we were doing like these these ancillary parts that could be bolted onto machines. And we got basically reverse engineered. Everything we did was being reverse engineered by the Chinese um, and the Eastern Europeans. And we just found it more harder and harder to cope. So I was working seven days a week. But at the same time, in that meantime, in that kind of like early 90s I'd, or late 80s, I'd bought a house, um, a vacation home here. And that was like the escape route, right? So I'd work seven days a week and I'd, I'd grind it out and I'd be traveling over the Pennines and to go and call on people and stuff like that in the winter time. And 
and but there was this there was this place that I could break out to in Florida, and it became the haven. It became the escape from from the from the rat race. And then the guys that had encouraged me to buy the house or had helped me buy the house that were there's an established brokerage here who were from Basildon in Essex, would you believe? Um, <laughs> great, great, great people. And they said, um, listen, we're looking for a guy that would set up our, our sales network, which is what I did consequently over the next year to two years. And they were reverse taken over by a company that they'd taken over. That company then got some finance, took the whole company over, and they were looking for somebody to run the British section and then come across and run the American section. So that's what I did. I got the opportunity and they came to me and they said, listen, would you come across the United States and run our Orlando office? They were based in Sarasota, Florida. Would you run our Orlando sales team? And I said, yeah, of course. So I came over, uh, inherited a team of 27 American realtors. And that's when I found out about racism because there was very much an idea that I was an incomer, right? And I came with all these these great ideals and like this kind of like wanting to get on. Why can't we all be friends and get along? And I dropped into a hornet's nest and that's when the learning curve started. So oh, we, wow. we, we dropped into the house that we'd owned, stopped renting it, went and lived in that house, uh, did some other investments uh, and started building a life here. How old are the kids at that point? So my youngest was really young baby, like very, very young. Uh, my eldest, my daughter, stayed behind for a couple of years in England, or no, about a year. She just didn't want to come across. So unbeknownst to me, my ex-wife and my mother got together and cooked up a plan where they promised her that if, they would, if we could fly her horse out here, then she would come over with the horse. <laughs> and we did. So I think it's 25 grand it cost me to bring this horse out here. So we flew the horse out. The damn thing's still around as well, would you believe, after all no this time? Way. Yeah, yeah, wow. it's still here. Yeah, it's still here in Orlando. In fact, it got moved last night from a different, from one farm to another farm, to another barn. So it's still here. It's on its last legs, but it's still going. So, yeah. Wow, legacy. wow. I've moved around a lot. Mm -hmm. but I did so just me and my wife. Mm -hmm. It's a, I, I, Now I've got kids, I'm always struck by, it's a whole different level of... Yeah. I don't know. Uh, it, it, there's just a, another layer of consideration that goes into it, totally. and you, you know, if it goes wrong, and it's just you and your wife, you know, you can deal with yeah. those consequences. But if you've yeah. foisted them on your kids, yeah. so I, I, yeah, in, in a way, so I have even more respect and admiration for people who do this with kids. Yeah. go in search of a better life, a better opportunity, all those good things, yeah. knowing that if it goes wrong, if it doesn't work out, they're responsible not just for their own. Yeah. Uh, a setback but that yeah. of their kids as well yeah it's, it's um, a massive risk and actually looking back on it you think why did I do that <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know? but, but it's worked out and, and it, like, it's everything worked out. works out for a reason doesn't it do you know what I mean so um, yeah yeah it's it, but it is a big risk it's a huge huge risk and that's why you need to set it up properly and that's why you need the proper professionals and the advice around you and you don't have that network when you first I don't know about you but I didn't have that network when I mm -mm. left here I was on a wing mm -hmm. and a prayer, really. Yeah, you know. Totally. And now I've established those relationships, and it took me a long time to do it. But now I'm, I'm so, surrounded by people who could help. But when you first get here, you are relying upon people, you know. It's a steep learning curve as well, yeah. right? Yeah. It's a steep learning curve. I, I said this last in the last podcast we did. Um, when you get here and you arrive here and you're a Brit and you speak you speak English and they speak English and we've been coming here on holiday and and you expect it all to be the same and it's completely different. Completely different. And you have to find a way to let go of what you expect it to be, and 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 I I don't know about you, but I butted up against that for a long time. Yeah, made me cynical. You resisted and, it. I yeah. whinged a lot. Yeah, that's <laughs> maybe right. I just whinged a lot anyway. Yeah, um, and you got to just you got to just kind of find a way to work within the system. Surrender to it. Yeah, exactly. And we obviously landing in Orlando. There were a lot of British people here at that time as well because we had a lot of people on on the E two visa, which is where you buy your business mm -hmm. and you don't you can never really convert to a green card. But as long as you keep that business going, you can stay here. So that was like at the time about a hundred thousand dollar investment, which is relatively like low amount of money, you know, but a lot of money for for a lot of people. But um, and they come and then they come and go, and there's like waves of people coming in and coming out. So it was a very transient thing. But I had a, a network of British people that I was able to drop into, but that in a way retarded my growth because what we were uh, doing yeah. is recreating yeah. Britain, yeah. and that oh, it doesn't wow, work because yeah. you're in somebody else's country, you know. Yeah, yeah, and it's super interesting, of course. Yeah. Uh, the kids. So yeah. the kids, uh, one practically grew up here, and yeah. the other one came here. Uh, well, yeah. She was old enough to ride a horse, so I don't know exactly what she was. She was old enough to ride a horse, yeah. yeah. Wasn't old um, enough to pay for it, but she was old enough to ride. <laughs> are, they, are, they, are they American? I, as in, I mean, I'm sure they're probably citizens, but what I mean is, do, do they see themselves as American? No. No, not at all. I think they see themselves in that kind of mid-Atlantic position. They very much uh, look backwards 
like my son, for instance, who's got a more broad bolt max than I have. Um, no. My daughter no. speaks with this kind of like mid at like, yeah, it's strange. And, and he's a, an airline pilot, a commercial airline pilot. So you can imagine the announcements on the radio, right? <laughs> <laughs> Flat cap airways coming into land, you know. Yeah. Wait, there's a sketch. There's a sketch show where oh, they it's, Harry yeah, Enfield and Chums, right? It's or the Yorkshire show. Airways, isn't it? Yes, it's, yeah, it's that's Yorkshire right, Airways. Yeah. Going to yeah. have a cup of tea. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll be landing at like, Leeds, whether you like it or not. Yeah. <laughs> so good. <laughs> so, they don't do TV like that. Yeah. That's no, so don't. good. But my my daughter's <clears> now thirty five. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so she's thirty five. My my son's thirty three. He's just brought his Brazilian fiance over about three weeks ago to live here permanently. So she's going through that journey now. And it's interesting because yeah. I've got perspective on what she's about to go through. Whereas yeah. she probably thinks at the moment that it's just like a big long vacation. And, you know, yeah, it's a serious thing, but it's, it's going to be easy. And it's not, it's not an easy thing to do. It's really not. But now I'm also a grandfather as well. I've got three grandchildren. So I've got one at 12, one at nine, and one at uh, just turned six as well. And that, those wow. are all my daughter's kids, and they all speak with American accents, which is really, really strange. Yeah, but they are they are American American, right? Yes, they are, they born are American. American assuming, yeah. assuming dad's American as well. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It's funny your life just just you know you had this moment looking up in Disney World, you made a decision, you somehow yeah. somehow willed it into existence. And that's right. And it's something and that I really didn't think it was going to happen. And when I, and, and now looking back. When I was thinking, I was like, you know, I, was, I went to Smithles Grammar School, which you'll know. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was thinking at Smithles Grammar School, when I, I used to study American history, I never, ever thought that I'd end up living in the United States of America. My second wife is from Miami Beach, from a Colombian family. And all these influences are in my life that I could never see coming. And I love it. it I celebrate it, you know, but it, it's quite the twisting, torturous journey. Just when you think you're planning everything, life plans you sometimes. Yeah, with well, the famous Mike Tyson quote, right? You've everyone's got a plan to get punched in the face. Not that That's moving it. here is getting punched in the face, but sometimes it, it felt like it that. It feels like it. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. I think you've already touched on. If we think about lessons, right? You think about looking back, what would you have done differently? I think you've already talked about a, a really uh, a, a really good one, which is you naturally gravitated to a British group, yeah, which is completely understandable. I'd do the same, but that stunted your assimilation here. Yeah, it really. If did. you if you look back. Anything else you did differently? Any any other challenges? Any other surprises? Lessons? That kind of thing? I would have... Um, the converse of what I've said about, about being with British people, and there's nothing wrong with that, of course, because I don't know about you, but when I speak to a British person, my jaw muscles relax. I can... It, it thinks flow, right? Yeah. It's just a weird thing. It's yeah. just... I don't know what it is. And But I love America. I love this country. I love... <laughs> I love part of what it stands for. Um, <laughs> yeah. Although things have changed rapidly since I got here. But it's... Yeah. The converse of what I'm saying is, is that what the the thing that I wish I'd done, if that's part of the question, would be I wish I'd have got involved with more American people in their country and listened to them, and become more part of the fabric of America before I did. Because quite frankly, it took me about eight to ten years before I really started becoming part of of the American fabric and understanding that no matter what I thought of it, it is what it is, what it is, and that business is done in certain ways, and even. Even the, the way that you greet people is different, right? Because you'll notice this when you get on the phone, that classic thing, hi, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? Doesn't exist anywhere else, does it, right? It's like it's, it's like this, this polite way of actually entering into a conversation. It might not mean a great deal, but it's, it's a polite way of doing it. And there's a lot of differences. And I just wish I'd have assimilated into the American culture more. And the reason for that is, the number one reason is, is that I think my growth in business would have been stronger in the field that I'm in because I was taking care of a lot of expat British people doing flying by programs, people coming over for three days or, or more, but I'd be with them for three days, sell them a vacation home, set it up with management and then move on to the next client and retain them as friends and colleagues and clients into the future. But there's a much bigger market and that's the American market, the people who live here. Yeah. So in my industry, you know, 97% of, of what we sell around here is to, is to American nationals moving and it's a very transient, you know, part of the world. You've got to use your British accent. With Americans, it's yeah. it, it, we, we we get away with murder here just yeah, because do. of the way we sound. It's uh, yeah. it, why Martha, one of my colleagues, she's like, you just just totally unearned privilege. Yeah, and it really is. Yeah, my really wife says is. that. Yeah. Same thing. Uh, you, so you've yeah. got to use it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's funny too because when you speak to another British person, we we divide north south, don't we? Right, yeah. Scotland downwards, and and, yeah. we divide, and so people can figure out. But of course, to to the American ear, it, it's pretty much all the same thing. I often say that I, I get treated like I'm clever and I'm actually dumb as a box of rocks. 
right? Yeah. Well, you get treated automatically like you're you smart. Treat, like you went to Oxbridge. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> like, Which you, I um, think okay. you did, didn't you? No, I wish. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take it. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't deserve it. But I'm going to, I'm going to leverage it. Although, right, it's funny you've said a couple of things there. The greetings. I have this running joke. With my neighbour. Every time he goes to greet me or say goodbye, I, I, I never know what's coming. It's like a, it's like a, like a high five or a fist bump or a, like a, a handshake that turns into a, into a like a, a fist bump. And I like, I just put my hand out to shake hands. It's really awkward because like then they'll grab my wrist or something. I'm like I don't. I, this makes me uncomfortable. Do you, I just say, do you get agree? anxiety with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Can yeah, we yeah. agree on a, on how we're going to yeah. greet each other and say yeah. goodbye? And yeah. I don't. I, I I can't learn this four point. Uh, uh, whatever you know, high five, come handshake, come fist bump. Point, at what point <laughs> your relationship becomes okay yeah. with that kind of greeting? Right? And then we bump shoulders. Like, do I bump your shoulder or do I not bump your shoulder? Like, I'm, I'm really like, I'll be, I'll know I'll be leaving, and five minutes <laughs> when I'm leaving, I'm having a massive anxiety on how, how am I going to exit? How am I going to get out of this? I'm gonna, I don't know. <laughs> so I yeah, said to him one very, day, I like, very need to agree. I've got to. I don't know whether this is understood in Britain or not, but what I've learned over the years is how Americans will give you a chance several chances that where, where my experience has been that this is a very welcoming place you know, I yeah, don't think it's because we're British I just think it's a very welcoming place I just think it's been a place where people will give you a fair play mate have a go you know um, and they'll take you at face value and they're polite to you as well and I don't think Americans carry that reputation worldwide but I've found them to be very generous of spirit very open uh, and very willing and, and quite self-effacing in a lot of ways because I think Americans generally know the problems with the country and, and, and the politics and the government and, and all that stuff. And I hope we return to a level where we all talk to each other a little bit more than, than we have Matt, done in recent years. Matt, I think, I think uh, that's testament to the Americans in your social group. I think there's a whole part of the country that is not doing any of that stuff. <laughs> Certainly not listening or <laughs> open-minded. as I'm finding, right? Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I've travelled all over this country. Though. I've, I mean, I've worked in, I've done stuff in, in Las Vegas and I've travelled all over the place, and um, there are definite differences between the regions, aren't there? Right. So, like Chicagoans mm -hmm. and, and, and Midwesterners are different than the what we know the New Yorkers or Philadelphians or Baltimoreans or whatever you call them. But it, it's uh, right. Um, I know Sam's with us here on the call, and, and I think are you from Baltimore, Sam? I am. Well, I'm actually from a uh, town about 15 minutes south of Pennsylvania but straight up the highway from Baltimore City. So about 20 minutes north of the city, but I grew up on a farm. So yeah. I have a, a bit of like a dual lifestyle of like, I live on a farm, but give me 20 minutes and I'll be running around the city somewhere. Yeah, a working yeah. farm. Yeah, my brother's an actual farmer. And so are, so is my grandfather and my uncles, cousins, or they're all farmers. Farming what? Uh, my brother, particularly, he does beef cattle as well uh -huh. as a bunch of produce. Uh, my family used to do dairy as well, but that is like extremely time. Yes, yeah. <laughs> extremely mm. time consuming yeah. nonstop. So I think some members of the family have gotten a bit tired of that and transitioned to, to other things. It's so, funny, isn't it, that farming culture thing? I used to go to school with a, a lad called Andy McGuinness, who was from McGuinness's farm, which is up on Scout Road in Bolton. And when we first went to school at the Scout edge of 11, Road. Scout I know Road, Scout yeah. Road. I don't know where that farm yeah, is, yeah. but I know Scout Road. Yeah. Right, it's right by the, the road that goes down to Barra Bridge. It's right there on the corner. It's that farm there. They used to farm uh, Jersey okay. uh, cows. It's like Jersey cream uh, milk. And McGuinness's, him and his brother Keith, they went to school. And by the time we got to secondary school at the age of 11, they were full grown men, right, with muscles and a work ethic. Nobody else had that, right? Because farm life's different, isn't it? It's just, it's just different. Yeah, so my, Sam, my dad would be your biggest fan right now because he constantly <laughs> well, growing up, says that. <laughs> was it like Yellowstone, Sam? Did you grow up on Yellowstone? I, I've not watched that show, and I think it's a little bit more Western, right? I mean, it's Yellowstone. <laughs> so I mean, for me, it was actually more less horseback, more hop on four wheelers and and head off through the fields to the farms. Uh, admittedly, I was not much of a farm girl myself. I kind of let my brother uh, do all that stuff. <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, similar life. I, he works around the clock. There's no days off. Yeah. Thanksgiving holiday, we actually have dinner at lunchtime. 
because he's got to be back at the farm at dinner time. So yeah. it's, it's definitely a lifestyle. And it's a marginal business as well, isn't it? It's not like you become a multimillionaire off farming unless you scale massively, right? But most farmers absolutely. are just about making it through, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a lot of pride. Because, uh, I mean, we do offer things to the community and our town is pretty small. So it's a lot of pride about taking care of our community and also just the way of life. I mean, my family's not wealthy in money. They're wealthy in land. And like, that's, that's who we are. And that's a lot of what America is. There's a lot of that America. Yeah, <laughs> that's maybe not New York and about like, jobs, yeah. money, Wall Street. It's a lot of this is my home and my property and yeah. protecting and passing that down and yeah. rich in land. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Matt, you went to Smithles School, mm. so that we didn't Vernon K go to Smithles. And Vernon Sarah K did Cox. go to Smithles, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, no, I think, um, yeah, Vernon K did, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Yeah, he went to Smithles. That's right. After he's, me. I mean, I'm, I'm 60 years of age now, so he's a young whippersnapper, yeah. young Vernon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Biggest Sarah Cox fan well. in the world, right? <laughs> Right, yeah, I remember, I remember seeing him in a local nightclub called Atlantis when we were younger. He was, he was like the, you know, the big dog, right? Yeah, he was yeah. the big dog in town, and everyone yeah. was like flocking around him. You know, he was a big star at that point. So it was the, a big the idea star. of him in Atlantis is very funny. Yeah, it's funny. There's, a, there's, I used to knock around with a lad called Pete Bramwell, who's now passed on, unfortunately. And his brother's Dave Spikey, who's obviously Peter Kay's. Dave Spikey, yeah. yeah, yeah. His, brother, yeah. his brother's Dave Spikey, did you say? No, my friend Peter, his brother is Dave Spikey. The guy, he's called wow. Dave Bramwell, is his real name. No, yeah. Oh, so yeah. You, knew, you, you know Dave Spikey? Well, or Peter you knew Dave Kay, Spikey? Well, here's the thing. Peter Kay wrote the first series of, of Phoenix Nights, or part of it, in the next door industrial unit to my engineering business off Washington Street towards like double, double kind of where. So that's where they'd come in in the morning and they'd write and be funny for an hour or two. They'd go and eat the lunch and they'd come back in the afternoon and they'd be funny for a few hours and then they'd go home, treating it like a job, right? And after Phoenix Nights, which won't mean anything to Sam, I'm sure, but after Phoenix Nights' uh, second series where they'd taken over the Phoenix Club, right? Yeah, well, the I've been there, Club, I've had a beer in there. Oh, well, I've played it with my band. I've played that, that no. place a couple okay. of times. Yeah. And, you and win. I, you yeah, win, Matt. Well, well, the, <laughs> the guy that Brian Potter's based upon actually was a gas fitter for the Bolton Council. And I met him. He came down because we had an, we had an amb ambient radiator that needed fixing. And he came and he, with his oppo. And he walked in the door and he went, is it broken? And I'm, I go through this whole thing about this broken amb ambirad. And he goes, no, no, I don't mean that, mate. I mean your, co your, your, uh, your coffee pot. Is your coffee pot broke? <laughs> And it was everything that you'd want Brian Potter to be, except it oh, without, without the wheelchair. Yeah, yeah. 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 Why did he put him in a wheelchair then, I wonder? I don't know. I didn't it's based I mean, on it's genius, isn't it? Right? It's, it's a genius piece of writing. It's very, very clever. Oh, it's yeah. a great, it's a great programme. Yeah. yeah, you win. You are more Bolton than me. I'll give, I'm well, going to give you that. Well, you yeah. went to Bolton School, right? Yeah. So Sarah Cox went to Bolton School, is that correct? No, I think Sarah Cox went to Smithles. She did, I, I think she went to Bolton School. Oh, yeah, I think she went to Smithles. Oh. Yeah. She's hilarious. Really? I think she's so funny. She's carved like, out a good career, hasn't she? Yeah, but she. I remember she was on BB. She was on. Radio, she got radio on morning show for a while, and yeah. um, uh, she, it didn't stick. I, the rest of the country didn't quite get her. But oh god, I think she was so funny. And she's like, on radio so too. Funny. I, I have the radio up on my phone, and often when I'm working here in the office, I have the, I have the BBC radio. On, and she's on radio too. And she's slaying it. She's still killing it. So yeah, yeah play too. <laughs> she's great. Yeah. She's yeah. just. A, she's just top proper northern lass yeah. and she's funny yeah. as hell let's, let's talk about your place in the world let's get deep okay let's <laughs> so do it so it's a show about being an expat right and and part of that is where do you belong you you, you, you are from Bolton born and bred proud you've spent a lot of your life there you've been here 20 odd years you've got American grandchildren got a successful career here doing really well obviously loving it it's by the sounds of it where do you, what, you know do you, are you American are you British are you, how where do you find? Where do you see yourself? Well, I think I, one of the questions I was considering for, when we were talking about doing this podcast was, um, I think, was like, would you go back? And the answer is absolutely not. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> when I go back, I get the willies. I get the. A lot of my friends are still doing the same things, which again is fine. I have no no judgment, but just from my personal perspective, I couldn't step back into that world. I don't know whether you found this, but when you get here, you kind of you forge this new life, but you never really belong in either place. And yeah. I think that's a common immigrant experience. You yeah. know. My mother-in-law, ironically or differently, in a different way, she's from um, she's from Medellin, Colombia. She's four foot eleven powerhouse. She's created mm -hmm. this. She created this incredible business in Miami Beach in, in the travel sector, um, and she has the same experience. She would never, ever, ever go back to Colombia. Very, very proud of her Colombian roots, but would never ever go back. And I feel the same. Mm -hmm. I love my country. I just 
the life that I have here, I don't think I could achieve it in, in the United Kingdom. So yeah. to answer your question, it's very much here. Now, where we end up, I don't know, because Florida might not be the place that we end up, and I'm always aware mm. of that. The amazing thing about America for me is how, how you can recreate yourself and create your experience here much more openly than you can, I think, than in the United Kingdom. The money supply is not as, as, as controlled, and I think you can move to California or Nevada or South Dakota or wherever you want to go and be who you want to be. And that's one of the things that always attracts me about the United States, because you, you can literally be whoever you want to be. I mean, nobody cares. But also the concept of staying in one place is is almost alien to them. I mean, I know obviously there are people who, who do, but um, my dad's lived in the house I grew up in uh, for must be 30 or 40, nearly 40 years now. And he repeatedly says, uh, you'll take me out of here in a box. No, I he means it, yeah. right? But, you know, in America, it's almost like a given that you're going to move somewhere to retire. Yeah. And, it, there's just people are just so much more open to say what I find making Richard, huge is, changes. Yeah, without a doubt. I've got some clients at the moment that are buying. Uh, we're doing a custom build home. I only met them two weeks ago. I was with them two weekends ago for about like over three days. They've got. They're buying this place. They're building it. It'll be built inside twelve months. Beautiful piece of land between two lakes. Gorgeous, gorgeous place. And it's like it's costing them less than seven hundred thousand dollars to build an unbelievable home on a beautiful piece of land with, with water views. It's, it's stunning, it's amazing value. And you don't get that in the other areas, right? It's much more no. expensive in the, in the cities and yeah. stuff like that, right? People are often surprised how cheap it can be in Florida. Um, but they've got, they live in Alpharetta, Georgia. They're originally from uh, Rockford, Illinois. They have homes in both places. They've got a place in Mississippi, a place in Naples, Florida as well, and they're gonna build another home uh, between the beach and this current home. And they're gonna build that, sorry, they're gonna move into that home just to oversee the build. And there's this expectation amongst the wealthy or aspiring wealthy people that you could have a lot of things. You've got a lot of choices. You can have your beach home and your city home. A friend of mine is um, running a, a brand new condo development at a place called Satellite Beach, which is in the Melbourne area of Florida on the Atlantic coast. These things are 3,000 square foot plus condos. The, the, the penthouse is 5,000 square feet. And they're being bought predominantly as second homes. And they're like $1.5 million and above. It's cheap to a lot yeah. of people because the wealth in this country is so great you know yeah it, it, it takes a lot of getting used to that i, I remember uh recently yeah. uh, there was a newspaper article talking about jeremy hunt uh, yeah. a cabinet member or vice prime minister whatever he is now mm -hmm. and talking about how he's one of the richest members of the cabinet i mean I, rishi Shuznak, sunak has kind of yeah, blown us out of the water unbelievably now, but, wealthy yeah yeah, yeah. but yeah. uh we're talking about jeremy hunt being one of the richest members of the uh, cabinet 14 million pound net worth that's a lot of money in the UK. I remember in America, like that's not that it's not much. It's I had a, one it's client recently who owns a, an air conditioning company in New Jersey who gave me a proof of funds letter, a letter which said I have this amount of money to complete the purchase of this property. I mean, yeah, it was a fairly prestigious property, but in one of his accounts he had thirty-two million dollars in cash, and he's not considered <gasps> to be rich. He's wealthy. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, we come across it all wow. the time. I mean. There's, there's a huge amount of wealth, in particular the boomer generation, right? The richest generation yeah. that the world has ever seen. Um, there's there's a massive started. amount of money. Yeah. Don't get me started, Matt. Don't get me started. Well, you must see it. I mean, that's, 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 you know. Yeah, I see our clients, are, are most of our clients are Generation X, and, and uh, I'm a geriatric millennial. <laughs> are you just at the end of the day? Are you I really? feel it. I feel really? it. I'm starting to feel it. Yeah, Good I'm a geriatric you, millennial. But most of our clients are Generation X, and I, and uh, let's just say I'm, I'm, I appreciate that. I like Generation X. Yeah. Um, you know, before as you were talking about, uh, it took you eight to ten years to really get involved and become American. I was just thinking, I'm coming up to nine years. Oh, I've just gone through eight years. And I'm an American. I'm an American citizen. But my wife's British. Mm. My clients are British. Half my colleagues are British. Mm-hmm. Most of the podcast guys' team, apart from Sam, are British. A load of our a load of our uh, vendors are British. Then that's blink, intentional. Blink twice actually. if you need help, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, and that's intentional, honestly. I, I, and yeah. we have actually tried. We tried to go more American on some of our vendors, but there was there was just a disconnect in in communication, and, mm -hmm. and we actually went back to Britain. And also, they tend to be cheaper, and which also is nice. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm at that point where I, I haven't fully assimilated. 
I, I, I've let I've I've stopped trying to fit America into my box. Yeah, because <laughs> America wasn't going to cooperate. That's you know, right. Totally unreasonably. But I've kind of <laughs> I've kind of learned to let go of that, and that's been really helpful. And I've de- and I've got American kids, you know, mm. born here, American kids. Mm-hmm. But I'm surrounded by Brits all day, every day. Now I, yeah. I'm partly glad for that because it means that hopefully I won't develop the the Middle Atlantic twang. I'll keep <laughs> my my lovely Bolton accent it's funny actually so James is, uh, James works for me James is from Philadelphia uh, no he was from New Jersey lives in Philadelphia James Boyle Irish descent but American born and bred right and he never heard of Bolton but now he he talks like an American but he will say Bolton and it was a, it was a, it was a client who picked this up. He was like, "It's like you say Bolton, like you're from Bolton." So he's just this, this regular American, never been to Bolton, never heard of it, but he says he says Bolton. <laughs> My wife said to me the other week, "I says, Are you okay?" She says, "I'm knackered. I'm not like you, you're from Miami Beach. You can't be saying stuff like that." <laughs> oh, I love it, love it. Yeah, but I'm, I, you've you've just got me thinking. Like sometimes I live in Greenwich now, which is just outside New York. I sometimes think, should I like volunteer? I mean, join the Democrat. Um, list I'm like should I volunteer then I'm like I've got two dogs who run at different speeds very different speeds one of whom is you know hard work two kids my wife and I both work I'm kind of exa- I'm kind of knackered myself yeah uh, I, I'm not ready to roll my sleeves and get involved in local politics but I'm just like I feel yeah. like we're setting down some roots here and I feel like I'm at a point yeah. where if I'm going to be here for a decade or two like I want to I want to go through the journey that you I, talked about it, I want to get involved a, I think that's a very important point that you bring up it's a decision I think it's actually a decision. I think it's a decision of going, do you know what? I'm actually here. And it, it took me a while to figure it out. Like I say, eight to ten years, I went, I'm actually here. I need to be here. I don't I don't just need to be an incomer that just happens to be living on the host, parasitically. I'm here. <laughs> I want to contribute. I want to be part of it. You know. Yeah, now, what yeah. I did notice, and, and something that you've just alluded to there, what I did discover about coming here is that you work longer and you work harder than I did in the UK. I mean, even in the last few years of my engineering company, I wasn't working as hard as I do now. So there is that expectation that you work hard and there's almost a shame factor if you don't. It's like, maybe I've got that wrong. Maybe that's just a personal issue that I've got. But I, I do think people tend to grind it more here than you do in the UK, generally. Uh, listen, I, we, we skipped past this, but I want to come back to it. Uh, I need to know. You need. I need you to expand on your comment earlier about you landed <laughs> here and inherited. Like it was a hornet's nest. The, yeah. What? Tell us more. So I'll give you an example. I'll give you a specific example. So in the Disney area, which is where I was living, south of the, the Disney theme parks, Disney built a town called Celebration. It's called Celebration, Florida. It's designed by a bunch of architects out of Florida, and it's part of the new urbanism movement. So you've got a central um, spot, like a central area shops bars restaurants around a lake and a hotel and then every, the, the, like, like the spokes of a wheel everything radiates out right so all the houses radiate out and it was built with this um ideal of being like this wholesome almost truman show type of, of, of place yeah. Yeah. and ironically i worked in the bahamas for a while at a, at a development that was designed by the same company same concept and that became the epicenter of wealthy British expats in this area. So naturally you gravitated because that's where the conversations were, that's where the business was, that's where the, the bars were. And what started out as a Disney ideal of cleanliness and clean living ended up in, in I mean, when people started driving their car into the pool on a Friday night, you know, and, and you know, all sorts of stuff going on <laughs> beneath the covers. Um, but that's where we got a lot of incomers from the, the, the costas in, in, in Spain. So people that had kind of burned uh, the bridges or they'd, they'd uh, kind of not been able to do what they prey on people in the costas came over here to do the same thing. So you ended up in this this place you never knew who you were talking to. And one of my experiences, by example, I got paid a really big, a very big real estate um, commission and I put it into the Bank of America, which is where I held my business account at the time. And I get into conversation a couple of nights later with a guy that I'd never met before, English guy, that was with another guy that was worked for the same real estate brokerage who was also English from, from Birmingham. This guy's reputation wasn't that great. I distanced myself from him a little bit because I didn't want to be in his company. I didn't like who he was. I just personally didn't like him. Well, this guy gets talking to me and he's, he's talking about this business investment and blah, 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 blah. And it transpired that he knew that I'd just taken this big real estate transaction and he knew almost exactly how much money I'd got in the bank. And the reason for that is, is that there was a British guy working at the bank who was tipping no. him off when British expats got money into the bank account so that oh, he could God. approach them to become an investor. That's disgusting. Yeah. And then it, and it, it transpired that what was happening is that the, the British guy in the bank had fallen on hard times 
And so what he was doing was he was gambling for a living, right? Or trying to gamble and failing badly at that as well. So he turned to criminality. And there was this underbelly at the time of British people doing fairly unscrupulous things to British people. It's going on now. We have the, the, ne the next wave that's coming is Brazilian investors. And a similar thing is going on in that, in that sector as well. So one of the things that I that I should have done is stepped away from that that sector of that, that kind of person, that that bunch of people, um, long before I did. And now most of them have cleared out. You know, they've had this to. is the this is the 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 unpleasant underbelly of yeah. expat life. So Yeah. Um yeah, I've been an expat in in the Middle East, and mm -hmm. the Middle East is changing a lot. But it's still, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, these ex, these famously expat destinations, you know, um, Far East, they, uh, they attract a lot of un um, unsavory characters. Yeah, and yeah, and then this kind of stuff goes on, and then mm -hmm. you, you can get corrupted into that group, and it, it's all quite seedy mm -hmm. and unpleasant. Mm -hmm. and that's one of the th that's one of the yeah. things that I like about America, and one of the reasons that brought me to America is most expats here came on a work visa yeah yeah you know they did they they were trans they were they were valuable enough to be transferred into company mm -hmm. and that that for me sets the bar the quality of expats here quite high mm -hmm. obviously there's exceptions but in general a lot mm -hmm. of the, certainly the ones we speak to came here on company transfers on visas and you've got to yeah. be a, 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 a quality person really yeah yeah so it's not quite the same but mm -hmm. I can imagine it sounds like where the pockets of that still happens the well, same the E2 same visa for me, yeah I mean I agree with you the E2 visa was a problem in our particular area in central Florida because you got a lot of people who could just about afford to be here but they had to make it work and then when they got here they found out that the business they bought didn't bring them as much money as they thought not as much revenue so then they either turned to doing things like getting into real estate or you know whatever they had to do to make it work because at the time only one person the visa holder could work and the spouse couldn't. So now they're over here, they've sold everything in the UK, they've been sold a bill of goods in terms of a business that probably had two sets of books, right? One for the tax man and the actual reality. Um, wow. And they get here and it's not working. And I saw, but it's heartbreaking, I saw people fail repeatedly and go back to nothing. My advice to anybody that's thinking about doing this and coming across here is do the groundwork and as best as you possibly can, engage with people who have had the experience of doing this that have your interests at their heart. And I can't express enough just how heartbreaking it is to see. I saw a policeman from Glasgow. He, he was walking around the building where our office was at the time in tears. He brought his wife and his family across. And the money that he'd given to buy the business was supposed to go to an escrow account, right? A holding account. And the person who created that escrow account, it wasn't an escrow account, it was a regular bank account, had taken all that money and scarpered with it. He'd sold his house oh, in Jesus. Glasgow. And he was there with his wife and two children. And I, I got talking to him, and he was a, he was a hard bitten Glasgow Scots, you know, that policeman. And he was in bits. And I said, you know, he described what's going on. He says, my problem is that I can't go home. I, I can't go back to Scotland, but I now can't go home to my wife and tell her. It's heartbreaking. And that was a British person preying on a British person. So that's the, the undersea, the underbelly, the, the seedy side of it. You've got to engage with people who, who know what they're doing and that can give you the right advice. And that's why people that have been here for a while that are assimilated that have those 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 connections are the best people to to engage with you know there's no real excuse for not doing now other mm. than uh, i think the reason for, linkedin really means that you can access this network there yeah. are a lo there are professionals like me you yeah. Uh, yeah. all sorts of people who can help yeah before people didn't really have that access and it probably was harder to find yeah but still people move here all the time and just land here and think, oh, it's going to be fine. And you're like, no, you, these investments, you're holding me a problem and you have to unwind it. And then there's tax issues and then it can get really met. And it's all so avoidable mm -hmm. if you just get get a network in advance. And people want to help. You reach out to people on LinkedIn, people are going to say yes. They're going to help for free. I, I do think that both, I'm obviously in your sector because you're dealing with finances. In my sector, I'm dealing with people invested in properties that they're either going to have as the primary residence or an investment property. There's a weight of responsibility that comes with what we do. Mm. The unfortunate thing is those people that are not designed to last here will come in and prey on those people because they know they're going home in a few years or they're, they're going off to, I don't know, Panama or wherever they want to go. I think if you've made that decision to be here and to create something with a legacy, with a structure, I think 
you're right, and, and, and people come on work visas are much more determined to make a success of it here. Those people are probably pound to a penny more likely to be the kind of people that are going to have your interests at heart than, than not. Yeah. yeah. So. I brought it down a bit, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, all good, all good. <laughs> um, if you, as you, when you go back to the UK, you go back, how do you, how do you feel though when you're back in the UK? I get excited when I get off the plane and it's never warm. Although I always tell my wife that it's uh, that it's going to rain and it never does when she's there. We call her the Sunshine Princess, so because every time we go, it's just it's <laughs> oh, miraculous. Nice. I took her. I was on I was on Rivington Pike with her a couple of times. Nice, ago, yeah. And, and it was like supposed to be raining. And it was blisteringly the heart was ridiculous. So I get excited when I get off the plane. I get excited going to see Manchester. By the time I get in the cab, driving up Hallowell Road in Bolton, I'm not that excited. Right? Hallowell Road, yeah. And then you start seeing people doing the same things that they've always been doing, and it kind of like it, it, it irks a bit, but. Going to places like Manchester, I absolutely love being in London. It makes it gives yeah, me, me too. A, a I love even, right? You, you feel yeah. the same? Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah it's, love, it's a real it. I guess world. I guess get, yeah, it really is. I, and I love I love New York as well. And I, and I actually love New York for history. It's just such a standard British like put down of America. Like, they've got no history. Actually, they've got loads of history, and some of it's great, and loads of New York, but. New York, London history, other than perhaps Rome, but London history is just unrivaled. I yes, love it. It's madness. And, and you're right, touching on that as well. I went to the Biltmore House um, over at Asheville. I don't know if either of you have ever been there before. I've heard of it. I've not been oh. there. I've heard of it. Martha's been there. She's. I looked at pictures. It's stunning, and it's it's a it's a testament to American wealth and um, old American money. I mean, that kind of American. If you remember, saved the British aristocracy in the 1920s and 1930s, right? So where all the, the, the guys that had been sat on their piles in the country and they couldn't afford to run them anymore, married American heiresses. Go to Biltmore, it's 250 rooms. It has a library which is three stories high with thousands of books, all read. I mean, all of them have been read. So there's, there's a, there is a depth, there is a history to this country that, that yeah. gets played down, I agree, yeah, yeah. completely. There's, there's, yeah. There's, some, there's a great history. And, yeah. uh, and a lot of it is in the southern tip of New York. There's a, there's a, a big uh, manor ho home... In just outside Bolton, I can't remember where, but it's it, there is one near us that's been bought by an American. I think the profile of the New York Times is like pouring millions of dollars into just a normal really? dude. I think he's from LA, uh, right. not like a, a multimillionaire, but he's a normal dude throwing. I think he's doing a lot of it himself, and then documenting it. And that's attracting people to it. But he might Love be like Rochdale or something. I might be <laughs> making all this up and completely wrong. But it's somewhere like Rochdale, I'm gonna, I'm gonna a find manor house. Yeah, yeah it's, amazing. It's, it's cool. There's no, so but there's, the history. Uh, going back to London. We use London as a jumping off point into, into Europe, but it's almost like we gravitate to London because London is a place to be. You can get your feet on the ground, you can breathe, you can get involved in all that excitement and all that life, and then jump off from there. Either go north to Bolton or wherever. We went to Scotland recently, um, took my mum and my sister, picked them up, went to Portugal, came back to Manchester, and then went up to Scotland for a couple of days, which was really, really nice because my, my wife had never seen Scotland. And there is, you, you're reminded that it's an amazing country, it's a beautiful, amazing. beautiful place. Yeah, it's an amazing I, I, place. I think you all, you, the, the, I did not appreciate Europe until I moved to the, the Middle East. Then, then I realised that the the how for, having an hour from Paris, two hours from uh, Madrid, three hours from Rome, like the, the, just unbelievable to have that well, on your doorstep. I, you know, you talk about Dubai. I mean, I didn't. There was no depth in Dubai for me. There was like no. it, it's all no, shiny I'm, and big and impressive, but there's no cult, there's no depth to it. You know, I'm grateful to Dubai. When people, no, you didn't ask me, but I'm going to tell you. I'm grateful to Dubai. Richard, are, because, you, are you grateful to Dubai? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm grateful to Dubai because um, moving there expanded my horizons. I was, mm -hmm. I'm from Bolton, <clears throat> went to college in uh, Nottingham, was living in Didsbury, South Manchester, mm -hmm. and I was going to, that was as far as I was ever going to get. My wife's from Berry or Whitefield uh, mm -hmm. area, and that's as far as we were ever going to get. And I wanted to move to London. My wife wanted to. Uh, my wife was like, "No, we've missed the boat. Everyone's gone. I'm not following." I was a bit of an impasse in my career. And we we were at a, we went out one night for someone's birthday, and we got chatting to a couple we didn't know. And they, I said, "Yeah, you know, a bit of an impasse." And he just moved back from Dubai. He said, "You should check it out." I was like, "No way." Anyway, long story short, two months later, we landed in Dubai. Right, just you know, it just it's wild when I look back on it. But two months later, we moved to Dubai, and like every expat, I was going for two years. You know, that's what everyone says: two years. Yeah. And then you either go back or you, you know, you're you're always an expat, and we were always an expat. And moving to Dubai, I also never really. It was just a bit. You know, I had a great time there, but it was you know it's, uh, it's a bit gross in some ways, um, and. 
and it's changed a lot now. Like uh, it really is. It's, it might change worse for some people, but anyway, um, it opened my horizons. The reason I am here now talking to you is because I made that move, mm -hmm. and that's that's mm -hmm. what I'm really grateful to it for. Fabulous. You, that's a great story. That's brilliant. When you're in the UK, do you feel like a Brit? Do you feel at home, or do you now yeah. feel? Yeah, you no, feel like I, yeah, no, I definitely feel like a Brit. I am, and, and coming from where we come from, they won't let be anything else, will they? Right. <laughs> I, <can't>. <laughs> <laughs> I, I went back um, on my own, actually. Uh, I think it was the last year, the year before, and I walked into my old boozer, the Finnish's Arms, at, at near uh, near Heaton Cricket Club, and um, there was a guy sat at the bar called Nigel Muller. I used to go to school with him, and I started talking with this mid-Atlantic accent. He went, you can stop that bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Fair play. Fair play. But I very much feel British, and I'm very proud of being British. Oh, I'm much God, more, that's good. I think moving away, I'm, uh, I'm more proud of being British than when I lived there. I Totally, yeah. Can you get a pint of flat cap in the finisher's arms? You can, actually. Yeah, you good. can. Actually, yeah, you can. Yeah, so Bank Top Brewery, right? Bank Top Brewery. Yeah. I, I, I love... Flat cap, named after. I Fred absolutely Dibber, right? love it. Yeah, I, I I didn't know that until you mentioned it to me. Yeah. But that makes total sense. But yeah, yeah. I really, really do miss. I've, I've, I, I've even I've even started watching videos on YouTube about how to make your own cask ale because I miss it that much. And yeah. importing the yeast or whatever it is, or yeah. the, the hops, spar, the hops from yeah. from the UK because the hops here is just yeah, I can't stand it, IPAs. It's the water that makes all the difference. It really is. And I, one of the things that's happened over my existence in the United States is the, is the growth of, of beer, particularly IPA beers. I mean, America is a centre of excellence for beer. No, not for I you. Can't, I, I can't do IPAs. <laughs> can't they? Just the hop, the hoppiness, or oh, just too the floral. bitterness. Yeah, I, I, and also when I, so I'm used to drink. I, I, I'm used to drinking pints of flat cap. You know, three and a half, four percent beer. Yeah. And then when I landed here, I learnt the hard way that American beer is often six, seven, eight percent. And I learnt the yes. hard way by by going to a beer, sitting at the bar and slamming five or six pints and then being absolutely trolleyed. What is that? <laughs> what is that? Because the beer is much stronger here and that really surprised me. Yeah. For anyone yeah. anyone thinking of moving here, just when you first get here, just stick to Guinness. You can't go wrong with Guinness. Yeah. It's like four or four point two percent. Yeah. You, you know, don't don't make my mistake and make a press of yourself the first three times. Everyone's like, this guy can't handle his booze. He's it's really embarrassing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, exactly. Exactly. Um, I went to I went to uh, um to um that was Asheville, wasn't it? Yeah, I went to Asheville. And um it's they call it Beer City USA. Um and at five o'clock in the morning next to our hotel there was a line um, just setting up for people to have a new beer that was being released that day, and there was a line of hundreds oh, really? of people. I mean, dedication to beer. It's amazing. Yeah. I never knew that culture I've got to existed. That. Here. Yeah, I've got yeah. to respect that. But yeah. um, right, Matt. So as we wrap up here, this is a podcast about being an expat in the US, and one of the topics that frequently comes up is the American dream. Mm -hmm. Now, this means something very different to to everyone, and it sometimes gets people uh, very exercised. So, with that in mind, what does the American dream mean to you? Uh, possibility. Hmm. Um, hmm. Yeah. America Amer always has done this for me, and no matter what changes politically or or, or in the culture, um, with the kind of culture wars we've got going at the moment, America is still a place of possibilities. It's a place where you can still fall down, and there's no shame to it. It's it's a place where you can give something a go, and if you fail, nobody really judges you because you can just pick yourself up and set off again. Um, so possibility is, is the potential of America I think is as vibrant and alive now as it ever was for people like me but I don't think it is the same for people that are not like me and I think that's what's the American dream for a lot of people has died but for me at my stage in my life I think everything's possible in this country and I think that it's still a great great place to be able to succeed and thrive and let's let's face it we're all after one thing aren't we we're after being happy. And I think that America is a place where you have the potential for being extremely happy if you make the right relationships and you take the right advice and maybe with a couple of lucky breaks. Hmm. When you say it's not possible for everyone, who are you referring to? Well, without getting too political, right? Um, I think there are some economically, demographically, and racially challenged sectors of this society for which for, you know, you'd like to believe that life was getting better for people. But the way that the money has gravitated to the top of society, for me, this is just an, my opinion, mm -hmm. and for the way that um, we have in recent years ignored 
the presence of institutional racism and mm-hmm. sexism and homophobia. And that's uh, uh, this particular cycle in the existence of this country. I think we're seeing a lot of people suffering under this retrograde reacting, this reactive way of thinking about things. We've made so much progress and we've started to move backwards and that's empirically affecting people. So for instance, a lot of my business in the real estate sector is based around vacation home sales and vacation home sales are often predicated on how much income a home will generate through Airbnb, for instance. That's dropped to by about 35%. The chairman of Disney, Bob Iger, who's currently at war with Ron DeSantis here in Florida, the the governor of Florida, recently made a statement saying that he wasn't really worried about the long term um, for the, you know, the prognosis for the rental sector, but a big influence on the drop recent in recent months has been the political climate and the threat to people's health. And he's talking about LGBTQ plus people and he's talking about, um, you know, people that are marginalized. It's not as easy to move around this state at the moment as it was unhampered. And that I think is, is, is sad. And that's one of the things that's changed for America. Quite frankly, I was brought up with a social conscience and I was brought up thinking that, cause we are, I'm from, a, from the North as, as we've discussed, and it's very much, we're all in this together. And I think that's kind of disappeared. So America claims the flag and the freedom and all that good stuff, mm. but mm. really a lot of Americans don't like other Americans at the moment. And I'm hoping yeah. that's gonna change because it's, yeah. it's saddened me to see it, really. Yeah. Uh, there's, it's just got ugly, hasn't it? I, we yeah. will get through this. I do, I do truly believe I it. I do too. Um, Might take a but while. It's got really, and the ugliness is exposed and there's more of it than we thought there was. I think maybe you got, we all got lulled into a false sense of security. Um, under the Obama administration, you know, changes, yes, we can. And then it all went Pete Tongue pretty quickly. Oh, it went Pete Tongue. But here's the thing I refuse, like the people that I've been out with recently are absolute died in the world MAGA people. And it's a choice, I believe. I've got some very fairly socialistic, fairly progressive attitudes towards life. But what I refuse to do is cancel people because they don't think like I do. I just happen to think they're wrong on a lot of ways that they think and the ebullience with which they express themselves. But actually underneath it, they're actually okay. And I, it's, I'm struggling with that idea because mm-hmm. like they've been fun mm. to be with and they're, and they're good people. And I just think they're wrong in their beliefs and I think they're of the time and they're just, they're just, they're just drinking the Kool-Aid. And, and right. I think and hopefully it will change as you say, Richard. Oh, Matt, I hear you. I hear you. And I, I've also had that same thing where you're like, how can this person believe these things and say these things right? And and they're treating and you're like I, I quite like them right but then yeah. what if you were black yeah. what if you were gay would you you know is, is it just because you're a white guy a British well, white guy you know well, like, but white straight guilt doesn't mean to say that the best route forward is, is, to, is to separate and cancel I, I, any conflict I believe is brought to an end through discussion negotiation and understanding because hate is born out of, of communication of fear. Yeah, and fear 100%. is born out of not understanding somebody else's position. And I'm very disappointed, but I made a decision. They won't have my hate. I will not be like them. I won't. Do I have to like them? No. But I do have to exist with them. And yes, it's easy for me because I'm neither black nor gay. Um, and so it's easy for me to say these things. But it's one of the things that I, I lament in the changing of America since I arrived here all those 20 odd years ago, is that mm. we've gone, now maybe it was just blind that it was under the cover, I think it was always under the cover, but I think we've made a lot of progress and a lot of issues and we feel to be going backwards at the moment, but like you say, hopefully we're gonna come out of it. Well, you know, just to, to wrap up this part with a little, uh, when I first moved here, not long after the riots in Ferguson were happening, because yeah, another black kid had been killed by police or someone, Yeah, and um, I remember watching TV and there was a new show and I think I think he's named Gordon Banks or Gordon Parks or something. He's, he's a, a, photog- a famous black photographer who took a lot of the, the civil rights photos from the 60s that you'd all recognise, right? And there was an exhibition of his work, coincidentally in Ferguson, I think. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe not, but anyway, there was a, the, a, a, fe- a segment on this new show. <clears throat> was uh, Gordon Banks. If I'm getting his name wrong, I apologise, but the famous photographer, famous black photographer showing off his photos of the civil, an exhibition of his photos from the civil rights movement whilst Ferguson is burning. And uh, whoever was going around with him said to him, I, you know, you've, you've documented all, all, all this 
this fight of the 60s and then you made such progress. How would you square that to what's happening right now in Ferguson? And he said, this is human nature. We take two steps forward and we take a step back. All we're doing right now is taking a step back. And I used to take great comfort from that because I was like, yes, that's it. Okay, there's, there's this, this reactionary politics going on right now. But that was like 2016. Yeah. You know, and then we're still here and we're still sliding backwards. And we will come through this. We will. And we'll, we'll I believe, we'll, the, what's that long arm of, long arc of justice bends towards just... Obama said it better than me. And I think whoever Obama was quoting said it better. But, you know, it, it, we will get through this, but it's, it's, kind of dim, it's kind of demoralizing. Well, for, so I also don't like the way that America's being viewed in the rest of the world because of the stupidity of some of our leaders. And I think we get poor choices put in front of us. I think we get given, you show up for this guy or this guy. By the way, never a woman. And certainly not a black woman. But yeah, you get yeah. these two choices. And yeah. I think the choices are, are, are BS as well. I really do, personally. But... It, it, the yeah, overall, yeah. America used to be. I think people used. A lot of people used to look at America like you know. It depends where you're from, right? But a lot of people used to look at America as a, as a place of hope, and I don't think that's the case anymore. I, I, I would love it if the next hundred years, the global community said, right, we can. For the next hundred years, only women can run each country. Just you know, give give them a turn. Right? Give, Let's be looking just, for a while. Just, yeah, yeah. Finn, uh, New Zealand, yeah. right? Um, yeah. Merkel in Germany, like just. Yeah. We, you've had your time. Yeah. You know, and you, you, in a hundred years, you can, <laughs> you can run again. But for a hundred years, let's see what they do. Yeah. And you know, women aren't perfect. Yeah. There are there are bad actors in in the, the yeah. female community as well. Yeah. But in general, I think they would do a much better job. As long you know. as it's not Marjorie Taylor Greene, all right. So that's oh God, the, yeah, the only caveat, right? Yeah, right. But we, <laughs> unfortunately, you know, we're gonna have to open it up to all of them. But yeah, yeah. hopefully, common sense will prevail. But in general, yeah, there, there would be, you know, there would, Marjorie Taylor Greens would slip through somewhere. But in general, I think, I, I think it'd be a worthwhile experiment to run, let's put it that way. Yeah, well, it's, everything's patriarchal. I mean, there's a, I saw a thing the other week, a documentary about how cities were designed for men to walk in, not women. Right? There's, oh, God, there's right. this whole thing, and it's depths and it's layers of understanding. And that's the key, isn't it? It's in, no matter, in business or in your personal life, it's about understanding the other perspective, isn't it? Right? Yeah. Understanding other people's perspective first. You can't be in a negotiation where you can't do your job unless you discover what the pain point is, what people need, how you can help. Right? And I think yeah. that's the same in every aspect of life is that if you can sh if you can create an environment where you're helping somebody else either understand or prosper or feel safer or be more comfortable, whatever that is, if that's your job, then do that. Do that. There's a reward in that because everything else follows, I think. Yeah. Right, Matt, as we wrap up, is, is there anyone else we can alienate? Is there any, uh, any, is there any other topic we can go on here? Where we, is there anyone else we can upset <laughs> and convince so. never to listen again? <laughs> I, no, I, I, think, I think we've done a good job of doing we've that. We've done it. Yeah. So we're just left with Boltonians. <laughs> I think there's a guy from Blackburn still tuning in. You know, uh, oh, we, 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 we gave Manchester a shout out. Oh, London. We've still, we've still got four cities in the UK who are on our side. No one else has abandoned us. <laughs> um, right, Matt, so I asked you what the, what the American dream means to you, but what does your American dream look like? My American dream is all about as I get older it's less about material and it's all about um, the spiritual it's all about about seeing the next generations prosper and leaving a legacy of, 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 of happiness and hope and peace and some yeah. money as well, right? Because yes, that's so. where you come in. <laughs> yeah, well next next time you're in the finisher's arms you tell that to the guy next to you, so you're all about the spiritual now with your, your mid-Atlantic <laughs> accent. See, yeah, like, I've got to the point in life where I don't care what people think anymore. That's, good. The, that's the problem. No, good. That's what happens. Yeah, no. yeah. So good. I don't want to upset anybody, but I do. I just wish the world peace, and I, I just wish everybody could get what they want without without denigrating and, and making somebody else feel less. And I think we can do that. In this, I agree. One of our values, and it's not it's not a value. So before anyone mocks me for this, it, but we we made our value, one of our values over communicate. It's not a value, but we think it's so important. It's so critical. I I truly believe most of the and you do as well. You just said it, but most of the world's ills, macro and micro between each other, could be solved by better, more frequent communication. If we over communicated and empathy, obviously you got to throw empathy in there as well. But you know, half uh, uh, the biggest battle is just communication. I yeah, think. For, and for so. seek to understand and then be understood, right? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I believe you. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. All right, Matt. So listen, where can if anyone wants to find you, where can they find you? So uh, professionally, Matt Dixon Real Estate dot com. It's D I X O N Matt Dixon Real Estate dot com. Um, yeah. 
My love, numbers. Love, the, love the M, by the way. You, Thank you've you got, very your much. Name yeah. is a, I've on there before. It's a fantastic video of my. Anyone, anyone who doesn't want to buy real estate straight away, don't watch this video. It's like can it? It's like sales <laughs> can his eyes. <laughs> yeah. So the M, my, my motif, my logo, motif. I love it. To me. My logo is actually, if you look at it, it's actually uh, an EQ um, off a soundboard because I used to be in a band. I was a singer in a band for a lot of time, oh, a long time. Now. Okay, Music's all right, yeah, I'm seeing, yeah. I'm looking at it. I've actually got an animated version of it somewhere that that's kind of like throbs like a like a sound bar. Um, so mattdixonrealestate.com is the jumping off point. Everything's on there. I've got a video about who I am professionally. Um, and then the social media links are on there as well. So that's something which I've, I've got to catch up on because it's not of my generation. So I'm trying to get help with that. But mattdixonrealestate.com and anybody that's come to Central Florida, regardless of whether it's to do with real estate or business or just because somebody wants a little bit of advice or a perspective on how to do things or an introduction to somebody else in any particular field. I think there's a lot about collaboration. I work with Compass and one of our basic eight, sorry, nine, no, eight central um, entrepreneurial points is collaborate without ego. And I'm all about collaboration. Truly, if anybody needs any help whatsoever, contact me at mattdixonrealestate.com and I'll help you as much as I can. Love it. Check it out, folks. What a great guy. Matt, you've been a great guest. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you for being on Always an Expat. Loved it. Loved it. Sam, nice to see you. Thanks very, very nice much, to Richard. See you as well. I hope to see you soon. Excellent. All right. See you, mate.